Coming to you from Brick House in downtown Brooklyn, I'm Brian Vines, and this is 112BK. Coming up, the New York Times reports that Donald Trump wants to define transgender out of existence. We'll talk to a transgender activist on what this could mean. When we are in community with each other, that means my struggle is your struggle, and your struggle is my struggle. And it's not, it's not trans people's issue, mm-hmm. not trans people's problem, because trans people are black, we're disabled, we're undocumented, we're Latinos, we are indigenous, we are part of every group. And then a young writer makes waves with a new collection of stories, looking at racism through an ironic and sometimes gory lens. If you imagine three people on a couch, the first person's sort of like, you know, this is really comfortable. I really like, you know, good lumbar, good lumbar support. It's right. really, good, really nice. That's important. The second's like, I think it's super sort of plush, just nice and soft. And the third person is like, I agree with you that this cu- couch is comfortable, um, but I think we're overlooking the fact that it's made out of corpses. Welcome to the show. Just ahead, we're going to be joined by a young writer who's getting a lot of buzz for his new collection of stories, drawn from personal and formative experiences that come with potential hazards, like being black or working in retail on Black Friday. But first up, Monday mornings are always a bit rough. But this one was especially distressing, as we were greeted with the following New York Times headline. Transgender could be defined out of existence under Trump administration. The Department of Health and Human Services plan to strictly define gender based on the genitals you were born with would, as the article puts it, eradicate federal recognition of the estimated 1.4 million Americans who've opted to recognize themselves as a gender other than the one they were born into. To tell us what this could mean for the trans community, we have a member of that community on the phone. Joanna Sifredo is the media relations manager at the LGBT education rights organization, GLSEN. She's also a comedian and the host of the podcast Trans Specific Partnership and a Brooklynite to boot. Welcome to 112 BK. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I should... Uh... Uh, disclose, I am the former media relations manager at Glisten, um, so I'm not speaking on behalf of Glisten, although they're an amazing organization. I love I love them. Um, they're doing amazing work. Um, so, yeah, it, um, if people want to know what they can do to actually support yeah. uh, trans young people, uh, go to glisten.org forward slash get involved and there's great resources on how you can support young trans students. Thank you for keeping us honest and being specific and intentional with your words, because as we're realizing more and more every day, words matter. So what do those words that are in this leaked memo mean to the trans community and any person in America at large now as we are watching the trans community? So what this memo does is that It basically erases uh, trans people, but also it erases the lives of intersex people by by narrowly defining how how people identify themselves. You know, people like to say that gender is biological, but that's not true. We don't actually assign gender based off of biology. We do it based off of genital. And that, again, erases the reality of trans people and intersex people. But what this means on the ground is that for trans people who live and exist in the world in the in the bodies and the and the ways in which we express our gender mm-hmm. that that is the race so oh, it makes it more difficult uh, if we it makes it more difficult for us to have identity documents that reflect our lived experience that reflect who we are today um, so that means it'll be more difficult to find housing yeah. it'll be more difficult to find employment um, because once you you give your identity documents 
and it reveals that you're trans, that opens you up for you know, uh, possible discrimination. When we look at the data, mm -hmm. those who are most marginalized within the LGBTQ community are trans people and gender nonconforming people, specifically trans and gender nonconforming people of color. Um, that also means that if we're not able to update our identity documents, you know, when one a member of our community is murdered yeah. and all federal agencies are required to, to treat them based off of uh, what you were assigned at birth, yeah. that makes it more difficult to find suspects. It makes it more difficult to get information gotcha. from the community because you're not providing accurate information as to who we is. are today and how we exist in the world. So, Joanna... So this is problematic for a whole host of reasons. Two years ago, you were at the Obama White House when he extended Title IX protections and made it specifically inclusive of transgender people. So I wonder, in that two-year period from Obama signing until President Trump right now and the actions that he's trying to undertake, has the community seen safety increase? Have there been reprisals for that? What's been the reaction from what the law was to the possibility of it being undone? Well, it's, uh, it's good to know that it wasn't a law uh, right now. In the in majority of states, it's still okay for employers to deny, to fire people for right. trans, deny people, trans people from housing, and not just trans people, but LGBTQ people in general. And the only way in which we will change that is if we pass a federal civil rights uh, act called, known as the Equality Act that mm -hmm. would protect LGBTQ people, and, and not just LGBTQ people, but uh, in housing, public accommodations, and employment. Um, what the Obama administration did was that they released guidance um, uh, stating that if, if schools were going to, uh, if schools were asking, how do we support trans people? Mm -hmm. More and more courts are deciding that sex, uh, that Title IX sex uh, discrimination includes trans people. So how are we? How can we be compliant? And so the Obama administration released guidance right. so that schools would know best practices. And the Trump administration had just tried to roll that back. Both that, yeah. keeping schools in limbo, trying to figure out how to support trans students, um, and, and and they're not even investigating claims of discrimination. Yeah. It was revealed, you know, earlier this year that the that since last fall, mm -hmm. the Department of Education has not been investigating uh, claims of discrimination brought by trans students, and and that's what the. The, the that's what the Department of Education really exists to do. For. You know, they have a civil rights office, but really the whole um, Department of Education really exists yeah. as, a way, as a means of providing educational equity to the masses. So in our last minute together before we have to get out of here, I know you may not have a lot of time for cis folks right now, but for allies like myself, what should we be doing to make sure the voices of our trans brothers and sisters are brought to the front and not erased from any sort of public sphere? I mean, I think you started at the beginning saying that, you know, words matter. I, I like, I'm not crazy about the word ally. I feel like it's disconnected mm -hmm. um, and it means like adjacent to, you know, like I'm your ally, meaning I'm helping you in your cause. Right. Whereas I like the word community, meaning when we are in community with each other, that means my struggle is your struggle, and your struggle is my struggle. And it's not it, it's not trans it's people's issue, mm -hmm. not trans people's problem, because trans people are black, we're disabled, we're undocumented, we're Latinos, we are indigenous, we are part of every group. So I, I would start with being in community and understanding that right now, some of those, the most marginalized within our community are being attacked. Right. And if we don't stand up for the most marginalized, where will this head? So you started off with intentionality and keeping us honest, and you finished up the same way. Happy to be a part of your community. Thank you so much for talking with us today, Joanna. Thank you. His debut short story collection, Friday Black, has been called Dazzling. An excitement, razor sharp, strange, crazed, urgent, and funny. 
And all this from a couple of true experts in the craft, Roxanne Gay and George Saunders. The stories offer an often dystopian and dark look at the issues of the day, like rampant consumerism, racism, and love. With a mix of the macabre and transcendental, some have said it's Black Lives Matter meets Black Mirror, though without the tech fixation. Already on a slew of must-read lists, it's set to hit shelves on Tuesday. And it brings the author, Nana Kwame Ajabrenya, to our studio. Welcome to 112BK, sir. Thank you for having me. I'm like sitting up a little straighter after that. Well, Thank you. There are worse things mm -hmm. to be said about a guy who's ready to drop his first book in less than 24 hours. It's been a long time coming. I'm, I'm happy it's here. So I said a second ago, Black Lives Matter meets Black Mirror. It's this very, like very real world that you've made, but it seems to be tinged with rot around the edges. If you had to break it down for people who are need to be spoon fed a little, how would you describe the book? You know, it's hard to describe it in, because there are so many different veins, but the thing I've been doing now, because I was once asked to describe it yeah. without doing any summarization is, uh, if you imagine three people on a couch, mm -hmm. And um, the first person sort of like, you know, this is really comfortable. I really like, you know, good lumbar, good lumbar support. It's right. really, good, really nice. That's important. The second's like, you know, I really, I, I think this is also great. I think it's super sort of plush, just nice and soft. And the third person is like, I agree with you that this cu couch is comfortable. Um, but I think we're overlooking the fact that it's made out of corpses. <laughs> um... That's kind of what my book is about. It's the three little bears of you, as you've never heard it before. Or go a little bit. It. I mean, and what I mean by that is uh, the book kind of thinks about the different ways we sort of, or different systems that kind of get us to ignore ways that we dehumanize each other. Yeah. And there's a lot of different ways that that, that happens in, this, in the book. So the best part about this book for me is also the worst part about this book is because I got to read it before a lot of other folks have gotten their chance mm -hmm. and I don't have anyone to talk about it with. So I was trying to pace myself yeah. as I read it, but I let a few things slip to a few people, but I'm wondering what it feels like for you to be on the sort of precipice of the world, getting to see a bit of what it is that you do. Um, it's overwhelming, but it's, it's also, it's, this thing you've wanted for a long time also, you know, and so it's nice because the people who have gone gotten it are, have been pretty smart. They've been kind. So that's lucky. Um, uh, but it is. And, and also, you know, you're sort of made to put your money where your mouth is. Like, you know, they're asking all these questions. You're like, I, I, I was writing. I tried my best, you know. And so you but but also you kind of realize, actually, you know, what? this is what I thought about this. Right. This is what I think about this. Um, it's been a. Uh, a lot of different things. It feels a lot of different ways, but um, I'm happy to have the chance to say anything about anything I've written. Okay, so we've had some guys talking about books for a few minutes now, a book that no one's gotten a chance to read, so I think it's only fair that in the author's voice we get to hear a little bit of Friday Black. Right, um, and this will be, um, this is the first story. It's called The Finkelstein Five. Fila, the headless girl, walked towards Emmanuel, her neck jagged with red savagery. She was silent, but he could feel her waiting for him to do something, anything. Then his phone rang and he woke up. He took a deep breath and set the blackness in his voice down to a 1.5 on a 10 point scale. Hi there, how you doing today? Yes, yes, I did recently inquire about the status of my application. Well, all right, okay, great to hear. I'll be there, have a spectacular day. Emmanuel rolled out of bed and brushed his teeth. The house was quiet. His parents had already left for work. That morning, like every morning, the first decision he made regarded his blackness. His skin was a deep, constant brown. In public, when people could actually see him, it was impossible to get his blackness down anywhere near a 1.5. If he wore a tie, wingtip shoes, smiled constantly, used his indoor voice, and kept his hands strapped and calm at his sides, he could get his blackness down as low as 4.0. 
Though Emmanuel was happy about scoring the interview, he also felt guilty about feeling happy about anything. Most people he knew were still mourning the Finkelstein verdict. After 28 minutes of deliberation, a jury of his peers had acquitted George Wilson Dunn of any wrongdoing whatsoever. He had been indicted for allegedly using a chainsaw to hack the heads off of hack the heads off of five black children outside the Finkelstein Library in Valley Ridge, South Carolina. The court had ruled that because the children were basically loitering and were not actually inside the library reading, as one might expect of productive members of society, it was reasonable that Dunn had felt threatened by these five black young people, and thus he was well within his rights when he protected himself, his library loaned DVDs, and his children by going to the ba- into the back of his Ford F-150 and retrieving his Hotec Pro 18-inch 48cc chainsaw. Mm-hmm. That's what we call a tease in the business. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So much there. <laughs> like this story opens the book, a uh, collection of writings, and it really sets a tone there. Why is that first up? You know, I um, really specifically, I think that story, the Finkelstein Five, my idea was if people read one thing of mine and never anything again, mm. that's what I wanted them to read. Um, that's It does a lot of different things. It's, it's a pretty brutal story, it I is. think. It's pretty intense, as you can maybe see from the beginning. Um, and so I think also it sort of is like if you want to ride this ride, this will let you know you can handle it. So if this not- <laughs> is the, if you have to be this tall, if you can get past this, you might get my sensibility. Maybe yeah, maybe maybe this isn't for you. Yeah. You know? um, also, you know, I was in college when Trayvon Martin was murdered, and I, um, like a lot of people, my age, I was very deeply affected yeah. by um, the that murder and the sort of subsequent acquittal of Zimmerman, and so um, I wanted to speak to that issue mm-hmm. specifically on um, black bodies being murdered and the murderers being let off with impunity the stranger early on. ground of it all yeah and i that it, it's something that's important to me and i so I, I felt it was necessary or important for me to start my first book that way so one thing that a lot of folks that i've read who've actually read that is they seize on this notion of dialing up and down the blackness and that is i don't know if they're all black people who you talk to but they seem to be fascinated by this notion of the code switch and how to ration that up or down but some thread that I saw through the whole thing was people doing a performance that's front facing and not just based on their blackness, but on their identity as a person, uh, children of child of an immigrant, like all of these different, even as a parent. Yeah. I think that uh, we think very specifically about um, what black people think about code switching because like the, it's so obvious, like literally, you know, it's easy for me to change my voice on a phone call and know that the results would be different. Sorry to bother you style. Yeah. I think there's a lot of um, nuances in so many different intersections of identity that, that people have to sort of adjust themselves. And there's so many ways that I'm sure that I don't have access to, but I I think moving to the world, it's something that to be successful, you almost have to be able to do. I, I think what's particular or maybe not specific to blackness, but what is in in part of the blackness code switching is sometimes your ability to not do that will very, very explicitly not give you something mm-hmm. or it might endanger you. Right. Woof. In a very real way as mm-hmm. outlined here. So one other thing I was struck by was uh, how you squeezed all of this out. So can we talk about process for a second? I'm almost tempted to come over there and see if there's a brand on the back of your neck in the Roman 12 (laughs) as referenced in your book. But really, how do you find this part in yourself and reflect things back in such a realistic way, but that is turned ever so? Um, for me, so that's a lot of the times where the surrealism thing comes in. So in this, for example, in this story, um, code switching is familiar to many people. Right. Um, I sort of had a way to hyperlink that whole, that, that idea of, through this conceit I created, which is a blackness scale. Um, so often I'll just literalize or concretize something that like is a felt experience, something that we know and understand and feel abstractly, yeah. make it specific on and, and concrete on the page. Yeah. Now all of a sudden we have something that's somewhat surreal, but also I'm getting to speak directly to this issue. Very clearly we kind of understand what this guy has to do to move through the world. Right. That, and I, I read less than half a page, you know, I mean a page and a half. Yeah. So um, sometimes the surreal aspect actually helps me get way, it helps me 
get to the real much faster than I would have otherwise. So on this idea of like bringing that forward and presenting it in a way that's easily digestible, there's this uh, on Friday Black, yeah, the title exactly. uh, story of the book, you talk about as a person who's working in retail, being able to decipher the code of these mm-hmm. like rampant consumer zombies yeah. from their groans and shortened little staccato ways. Yeah. And so if you have a guy who's like screaming, ah, beating his chest, this main character who, because he was bitten by one of them previously, understands the dude. He's saying, ah, but what he means is like, I only have my son at Christmas and this is the only thing he wants and I really, really need to feel like a father. Yeah. And again, it, it's, this, it's this sort of consumer fervor that we know and understand, but by using that sort of conceit of the zombie thing, mm-hmm. I get to one, point a very, like a very specific light on this issue and also kind of engage it in ways that are one, fun and inter- engaging for me, right. but also I think also get directly to the point. That right. is like, I under we I know that people aren't going to these stores treating each other for poorly. For jacket. Yeah, or just to jeans. be mean. Yeah. yeah, it's not the thing. It's, you know, so much of marketing is basically getting people to conflate things with love or things with a thing or person they love. And yeah, you translated a groan to mean mm-hmm. I'll finally be popular if I can just have this jacket. Yeah, and even like, you know, because even self-love is important. And like, yeah. but, the, but they, I think so much of this world is good at um, ripping your ability to love mm-hmm. from you and then selling it back to you, you uh-huh. know? I mean, like, you, if you could have self-confidence on your own, no, you need this thing. Right. But luckily, I have this thing. <laughs> I got this jacket for, for the you. low price of. <laughs> for this low price of more than you can afford. <laughs> so, you know, why don't you? But this is born of partially some real experience that I read you had working in retail for a popular outdoor manufacturer. And all of us have had this experience of seeing people with their wigs knocked off, going for that TV or that mm-hmm. toaster at a Black Friday sale. Yeah. I worked at several different stores. Um, I worked at Stephen Barry's. I was under the, uh, as an unknown specialist at Lowe's Home Improvement. Yeah. And I also worked in a all, against all odds, which like a, they call it an urban clothing store. Yeah. And um, yeah, I've seen people act crazy yeah. for jeans and sneakers. So wait, how does the son of an immigrant who had all those disparate jobs that we all do? Imagine he's going to be sitting behind a mic talking about his story collection that's coming out tomorrow. What is that path? I don't, uh, it's a, I don't know. Um, it's one that a lot of kind of blind faith in, mm. or not even blind, uh, a compulsion that you kind of follow. Um, you know, I, I, I'm, I was joking. I, I finally figured out what you got to do to, as a son of immigrants to get your parents to sort of buy into your artistic sort of path. And you know, all I had to do was get a profile in the New York Times. I Nothing was like, succeeds like success. Why didn't I think of that earlier? <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I I wrote and I told stories with my friends just sort of orally and like I wrote little dumb fantasy stuff because it was something that was free and no one could take it away from me. Right. And um, I didn't think that I could be a writer. I didn't know writers. I didn't have any concept of what literary was or is. I still don't know if I do. Yeah. Um, and I uh, got lucky that in college I went up to um. A woman named Lynn Tillman. I told her like, you know, I, I want to be a writer. Yeah. Sort of, and you're a writer, so like, was good. <laughs> right. Put <laughs> it on. Know what me. to do? <laughs> just literally, like, I thought she was gonna like give me like a special pen. <laughs> the one. I thought just by being in proximity to her, maybe I would get it. She mm. gave me a bunch of, and it kind of was true. She just yeah. gave me a bunch of things to read, and I read them all, and I reported back to her, and I took her workshops, and she said these are all bad in her very kind way. And I took her workshop again, and she said these are all better. And I eventually um, applied to a Syracuse MFA program because one of my favorite authors who I discovered through her was there. Yeah. And that, um, that, that being George Saunders. And so, and I got somehow got accepted. And now he's a fan of yours. He's a, he's a friend of mine now. Even better. You know, um, but yeah, he's a, he's, he's a, a very important mentor to me. Yeah. A good friend. And uh, I don't know, there's a, I mean, in, in between those from, being like not think I could be a writer till now. Right. So much has happened. I'm not. I'm a little sort of unsure that's even real. It's um, real. You're but here. Uh, yeah, it's been a crazy ride. So if you could beg one thing of the twelve tongue God on your journey with this book and your success and your debut here, what would you request? That's a so that would so if I could speak to sort of like a muse type character. 
I mean, I, I think that the answer would be, and it's hard to say this because I try to get this to my students and to like people that ask me about what it means to like be where I am now. Yeah. I would tell them to like chill <laughs> a little bit actually. Um, meaning I would say like, I, I hope it's important for people that are striving and going for things to know that um, you are not any less worthy of all the good in the world because you haven't achieved some goal. You know, I yeah. think I, I, writing is very important to me. I pretty much, the last 10 years, very specifically, every day, mm -hmm. I've thought about today slash tomorrow coming, you know. A second ago, you said where you are now. Where are you? The day before my book comes out, you know, um, nationally uh, and actually internationally. Um, but, um, you know, light complex. Um, but um, I think... Uh, I wish I would have been able to tell, I wish the 12th son God, I wish I would I would tell him like, listen, he's gonna be okay, you know, relax, because I was so sort of obsessed yeah. with this sort of achievement narrative. I really thought I had to, it made me sort of think of other people as liabilities, including my family. Like, mm -hmm. I was sort of ignoring the people who I was supposedly doing this for, because I very consciously and specifically was trying to get successful to like help my family out, which I don't know why I chose art, but whatever. And um, And now I think, I wish I could I could tell myself, hey, like take a step back, breathe. Yeah. You're gonna do it. Um, it's gonna be all right. And I try to I try to like make that clear with people who like know me as a yeah. writer. I hope that because I think you can get really consumed in this like let me just suffer. I have to okay. suffer gotcha. to to do well, and I don't want that to be like the default. So he's too humble to flex, but I can let you know <laughs> that Friday Black is available by the time you see this. And if it's not, just pre-order it. Mm -hmm. Friday Black, wherever books are sold, this has been a great pleasure. I'm glad we can mm -hmm. say we met you in. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. It's been an honor. I, and, you know, you guys are kind for having me, so I appreciate that. Thank, Thank you, you so much. It's going on our highlight reel. <laughs> Thank you. It's going on my highlight reel for sure. And now some news. Six children were diagnosed with measles this month in Williamsburg. These days, a rare but still dangerous occurrence. The kids age 11 months to four years old live within the Orthodox Jewish community. And officials have confirmed that the initial case was contracted by a child visiting Israel, which is undergoing a significant measles outbreak right now. The measles vaccine is supposed to be administered at a child's first birthday. But four of these children were well past that and have yet to be vaccinated. The CDC warns that measles is highly contagious and is transmitted through air, droplets, and direct contact. So if you think you've been exposed to measles, contact your health care provider before going to the facility. As the international outcry over the fate of Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi grows, the Metropolitan Museum of Art and the Brooklyn Museum have opted not to accept Saudi funding for projects linked to a broader Arab art initiative. Collecting and Exhibiting the Middle East, an invitation-only symposium scheduled for October 23rd, is part of a just-launched Arab art and education initiative an ambitious year-long citywide cultural exchange program in New York. The Mets president and CEO, Daniel Weiss, has informed participants that the event, which originally was partly funded by an organization linked to the Saudi prince, will now be entirely self-funded. Speaking of funding, the Red Hook Community Farm was awarded $25,000 by the New York State Department of Agriculture and Markets. The farm, located on the corner of Columbia and Sigourney Streets, directly across from the IKEA, produces everything from carrots and squash to plums and apples. And it's open for business on Saturdays from June through November. So you still got a few weeks to get your hyper-locally sourced produce right after you buy a stylish but cheap night table named Vikammer. On Sunday, an outdoor vending machine in Williamsburg that sells fancy jewelry was ripped off to the tune of $13,000 worth of merchandise. Manhattan jewelry designer Marla Aaron planted the machine in the park outside the William Vale Hotel on North 12th Street. 
after getting the idea from her travels in Japan, where vending machines sell all types of high-end goods. The perpetrator pulled off the heist with bogus credit cards and strolled away with the loot while security cameras were rolling. The machine has since been permanently removed. No word yet about increased security around other vending machines in the city selling Twix, Cheetos, or those Snyder's pretzels. Thanks for watching. Tomorrow on 112BK, I'll talk to Borough President Eric Adams about the upcoming census and how he's working to make sure all of us Brooklynites are represented. We'll see you then.